are recording for a Ganyma blog post. The blog post should be called for now Jolen Ba Ganyma, J O L E N P A, which means a uh, Bodhisattva. Um, Lord Tsongkhapa was predicted by Buddha Shakyamuni to appear in the future and revitalize all the teachings that Buddha had given when the teachings were slightly in decay. During Buddha's time, Lama Tsongkhapa was a young boy who saw Lord Buddha and made offerings to Lord Buddha. So he made um, offerings of a crystal rosary to Buddha and at that time Lord Buddha had put his, placed his hands on the young boy's head and predicted that in the future, in the land of the north, that when the teachings are degenerated and they needed a rejuvenator, a renaissance person to appear, Lama Tsongkhapa or Lord Tsongkhapa would appear at that time to bring a brand new renaissance and revitalize the teachings and repair those that has been so-called damaged. How do, you damage, how do you repair damaged teachings? You receive the teachings and you practice it and gain attainments. And when you, from attainments, you give the teachings to others, you revitalize the teachings. Now, as Lord Buddha predicted, it had happened, and Lord Buddha also predicted the coming of Gandhan Monastery, in which he had one of his close disciples who had achieved miraculous speed of walking, put a white conch shell where Gandhan Monastery was founded by Lama Tsongkhapa. And so it came to pass that Lama Tsongkhapa came and he had over, amidst great signs and dreams and portents from his mother and the area, Lama Tsongkhapa was born. And he was very different from other children in a sense, he was extremely compassionate, very spiritual, and already had a great disposition towards the Dharma, and would instantly understand Dharma texts and teachings, and was able to teach and compose from a very young age. And from a very young age, Lama Tsongkhapa had had many visions and direct contacts with various deities. He himself was considered a direct emanation of the Buddha Wisdom Manjushri. So therefore his name throughout his life was always referred to as Manjunata Tsongkhapa or Jamgun Tsongkhapa which means the one who is one with Manjushri or who is Manjushri. During his lifetime he worked very hard to study under 45 teachers of the Nyingma, Sakya and Kaju sects, even some of Jonangba, right? Yes and combined all the teachings and lineages and practices of Sutra and Tantra that, and brought them together into one vessel later to be known as the Gandemba teachings or the Gilukpa teachings. And in order that these teachings do not degenerate, Lama Tsongkhapa himself had instructed his students to build Ganden Monastery, to find sponsorship, and to create a monastic system. So Lama Tsongkhapa, during his lifetime, with his students, had created Ganden Monastery. And from Ganden Monastery, as the root monastery of all Gelugpas, many other great monastic institutions such as Sarah and Drepung and Dashi Lungpo and all that arose. And in the history of Tibet, they, these monasteries have created literally thousands and thousands and thousands of enlightened beings, attained beings, scholars, masters, pundits, yogis, meditators, ascetics. Many, many young boys from all around Tibet aspire to enter Gandin, Sarah, Drepung, 
Dashi Lumpur monasteries to study, to obtain their degrees, and to go on to meditate what they have learned. So Gandhan Monastery, the mother of all Gilukpa monasteries, or the father rather, the father of all Gilukpa monasteries, has produced countless beings. And the teachings of the six jewels and two ornaments of India are enshrined in Gandhan. And the commentaries and the teachings and practices and the visionary um, teachings by Lama Tsongkhapa are in Gandhan and so forth. As a result of these very powerful, sacred and holy teachings, many great masters were produced. Many Gandhan Tripas, many Mahasitas, many Iridite Geshis and Pandits were produced, just like Nalanda Monastery of India in the past. Due to the cultural revolution in China, Tibet and the monasteries had to move to India and Gandhi Monastery was established in South India. The curriculum is exactly the same as it was in Tibet and although the number of monks did not number into the, into the three or four thousands as it was in Tibet, there was more than two thousand in Gandhi Monastery. When I arrived in Gandhi Monastery in 1988, January, I had made a few friends, a few close and good friends in Gandhi Monastery. I had a lot of acquaintances, but I had a few close friends. You have to understand that when I arrived in Gandhi Monastery, there was over already 2,000 monks at the time. And so we would go for pujas and prayers and learnings and all the activities together. And a few of the monks became my very good friends and they would come over when we had free time to chit chat or we go for walks, circumambulations, or we discuss dharma. Or sometimes we go to the city to buy supplies together. So I had a very good friend from Gandhan Jangse Monastery, and his name was uh, Gen Pun Sok. And we had gotten along very well. We would always talk about Dharma, various Lamas, Dharma subjects, Mahasiddhas, monastic events and happenings, and so on. And it was from my friend Gen Punso that I had the great fortune for the first time to hear about a very achieved modern day yogi ascetic master and his name was simply Gen Nima. Gen in Tibetan means teacher and it, was, it would be the way you address monks as Gen and to call them by their name directly was considered very rude. So you would address all monks as Gen. So in this case, this monk's, this senior monk's name was Nima. And we would address him as simply Gen Nima. As time went on, people start to honorifically address him as Jolempa Gen Nima. Jolempa is a Tibetan word for Bodhisattva because they believe that he achieved the bodhisattva level of meditation. And so Gen Punzok would often tell me various stories and happenings about Gen Nima because Gen Nima belonged to Ganden Jangse Monastery. Ganden Monastery is divided into two. It's divided into Ganden Sharte and Ganden Jangse. Ganden Jangse is Ganden North Point. Ganden Sharte is Ganden East Point. We're one monastery, but we're divided into two, with two abbots, two kitchens, two prayer halls, two administrations. And we're joined together by Ganden Lachi, which is the main prayer hall for all monks in Ganden. And so Gen Nima comes from Ganden, Ganden Jangse Monastery, which is the same monastery as Geshe Punso. And so what had happened with Gen Nima was he had studied up to Madhyamika level in the monastery. 
and he would have to prepare for another five to seven years of exams and debates according to the Gilukba um, curriculum to get his Geshe Haram degree or PhD in Buddhist studies. Well, before he would do that, when he finished his studies, he basically grabbed his few meager items and disappeared. And nobody knew where Gandhi went to. And mind you, this is way before I entered the monastery. But Geshe Punzuk was around that time. I'm sorry, Gen Punzuk was around that time, although young. And so Gen Nima had just disappeared. Totally disappeared. And nobody knew what happened to him. He finished his studies, he wouldn't go he wouldn't go for his exams, and he was not to be seen anywhere. A few years later people heard that he ended up in Bhutan. He didn't end up in, in the cities of Bhutan or in the towns, but he was in the deep forests of Bhutan that there was no roads to go there. And somehow Gen Nima had gotten to, the, gotten to Bhutan, stayed in the forest, very deep, way far away from civilization. He built his own little cabin his own little wooden house. In his own little wooden house, um, I would guesstimate from the description from the monks, was not more than seven feet by six feet. And it was enough to, for him to fit his bed. And in front of him, he had a small painted scroll or tanka of Tsongkhapa in a picture of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and then in front he would have a large butter lamp and he stayed in this hut and meditated and he meditated for many years quietly till some hunters and gatherers and all that as they would be in, near any um, forests of the locals came around and they discovered that there's this monk meditating in the middle of the forest in a house by a river. And Gen Nima would gather all his water and washing from the river. And um, I'm not sure how he got his supply of food at that time. And he'd stay there and meditate. And when people discovered him by accident, he wasn't happy he was discovered because he was looking for a solitary retreat place. But word got around that there was this meditator monk. And so people started coming around and making offerings to him. Making offerings of tzampa, of butter, of ghee, um, salt, oils. And it became a disruption for his meditation because they'd be knocking at his door at all times of the day on certain days that they would come. And so some of the visitors started to ask Genima for blessings to blow on their affected parts of their body that was not well. And miraculously, the parts of the body that he blew on would recover. And this news spread. This news spread like wildfire. Because this is, this, is this is the stuff that legends are made of. This is what we read about, about the ancient Indian Masi does in the forest. And then people started coming to him to ask for divination. And he would have a dice. And he would throw these dice. Well, he would have three, he would have a dice and he would throw the dice. And he would foretell the future or give directions to people or give prophecies to people according to their questions. And it turned out to be extremely accurate. So his fame started to spread. It spread to Bhutan all over. It spread to India, where all the Tibetan settlements are, and definitely spread to the monasteries. And we started hearing about this. And so more and more people started visiting Genima. And uh, one day, one of the visitors was a Tibetan ex-army guy. 
and he had visited again Ima, and by listening to him speak, he had gained great faith. And this person was illiterate. He was not educated, just a, a, a Tibetan soldier. And he gave up his soldier's uniform and joined Yen Nima as his attendant. So from henceforth, this person, this older person, took ordination and became a monk. And he washed Yen Nima's clothes at the river. He gathered the water. He made the tea. He made the food. Sometimes um, he would go to distant places, to, you know, to towns to buy supplies. And when the crowd started coming, he would be basically the crowd manager to, to ask people to come one at a time or, or again, Nima was not available. I mean, he basically became kind of like the assistant attendant and the assistant and or attendant. And this person stayed with Gen Nima loyally to the end. He just served Gen Nima. And um, people started... People started hearing wondrous, miraculous tales about this old Gandhian monk in the Bhutanese forests. And there were also people who didn't really practice Buddhism sincerely from other sects in the area who were spreading rumors about Ganima. And they were jealous of his fame and entertainments, but it didn't hinder his benefit towards the people. And it was well known that the Queen Mother of Bhutan had heard about Ganima and she was ailing. So she instructed her courtiers, courtiers and people to escort her and take her to visit this monk. And she did. She went into the forest with her assistants. I think she was carried. And she met Ganima. He did blessings and divinations for her, and her ailments completely healed. And this is the Queen Mother of Bhutan. And because of her healing, great faith and great respect arose for Ganima in her mind. And she wanted all of Bhutan to be able to benefit from this old monk and this sincere practitioner. So Unbeknownst to Genima, from many, many kilometers away, she built a road from town center to Genima's residence. So it would just make it easier for people, especially the sick and the crippled and the lame, to get there. Well, by the time the road was built, Genima had nothing to say because it was too late, it was built. But you have to understand, he had gone into seclusion for meditation. But the Queen Mother had done that. She had built a road for people to access Genima much more easier. And that was the first time I had heard about Genima's story. And mind you, I have not met him. And then also that many people started coming and offering Genima small, about, small bits of money with katas as a way to create affinity with him. And we had heard that Genima would take very little bit of the money to give to his assistant to buy supplies for them. And then the rest, he would take half of the offerings he has received and offer it to the Dalai Lama because there were monks coming from Gandhan all the time to see him. And on the way down, he would give them the money to offer it to the Dalai Lama. And he had done this for years. His offerings, he'd offer half to Dalai Lama. The other half, he was sent to Gandhan Monastery and offered to Gandhan Monastery. And he himself kept nothing except whatever little meager amount he kept for his um, sustenance and his assistant sustenance. And we had heard this. So, um, I mean, there weren't large amounts. You know, I heard that he had offered 20,000 rupees one year to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he had offered like 20,000 rupees to the monastery. Well, 20,000 if you convert is not a lot, but 30, 40 years ago, it was a lot. And for a hermit monk, where people would offer one or two rupees because they were basically very poor villagers, gathering that amount was a lot. But the incredible thing was 
how Genima was totally not attached. And he had offered everything that he had to half to his holiness and half to the monasteries, which is Gandhi Monastery. And that was such an inspiration for us because you can see he practiced renunciation in, in its entirety. And then we had heard stories that there were other disciples of other lamas who were jealous of Genyama's fame. And they would they would they had come a few times to try to poison Genima by giving him poison cheese. And um, most of the time when they offered Genima cheese, he would happily accept it, make offerings, and eat it. But there was on one occasion that his attendant had said that cheese had come. And very uncharacteristically, Genima asked his attendant to hang the cheese on the nearby tree. And Genima was asked, aren't you going to eat this? He says, no, just hang it on the tree. And when they hung the cheese on the tree, within a few hours, the cheese had, had exploded. Not a gun of firepower, a powder, smoke explosion, but more like the bag that the cheese was in, and the cheese just broke and splattered all over the place. And later it was found out that the cheese was actually poisoned and the color was very strange and the smell was very bad. So that was one of the first attempts of people who were jealous of Genima trying to poison him. But it didn't work because Genima had clairvoyance and he had known the intentions of the persons and had the cheese hung out. And this was told to me straight out. And uh, I mean, I didn't have any doubts because I've seen other very attained monks in the monasteries who exhibit paranormal powers. So I'm not surprised, but I just thought, how sad that when you have a living saint, a hermit, in a forest, and instead of getting his blessings, you try to get rid of them. I was more amazed at that. I wasn't amazed at his supernatural powers because it's quite common among high, mon high monks. And so I heard that story. At the same time, um, I had heard that he did four sessions of meditation per day. He had done four sessions of meditation in a day, which is something like um, 3 a.m. to around 5, 5.30 a.m. He would be in meditation, and they would break for breakfast, and around 8 to around 11, he would be in meditation. He would break for lunch. Then in the afternoon, he would start around 1 or 2, and, and and meditate until um, about 4.35 and have his dinner. And then he would continue his meditation at night from around 7 to around um, 8 or 9 and go to sleep. And the primary meditation that he focused on was Yamataka. So Genima would do the Yamataka long sadhana four times a day with ritual and offerings and the mantra, and the full meditation. And I was like, I was really amazed because as spoken in the Tantras, you can gain many higher levels of attainments. And that's, that's pretty much what I know about Genima's background story. And, um, People in the area had said, in order to tame the hunters in the area, people would often see a large white deer stag, albino, white, huge, with huge antlers, horns. And, they, and the hunters would be like, wow, that's, that's a big prize. And they, <laughs> they would run all over the forest with their weapons to shoot this stag down. One time, they chased the stag through the forest and they found that the stag had 
somehow snuck into Genyama's house where he was meditating. And the, so the hunters were very happy. They said, well, he's in that little house, so we're going to go in there and catch him. You know, we're going to kill him. And when they went inside the little house, as I said, it's just one room, they saw the old monk, Genyama, sitting there, drenched in sweat and panting. No deer in sight. So they would see the deer enter his meditation hut. They would immediately follow. I mean, they didn't know there was a monk inside. And then when they went inside, they found Genyama drenched in sweat, hyperventilating, as if he has been running. And they asked, where's the deer? He said, there's no deer here. And they end up staying and they get a Dharma talk about the non-virtues of killing animals. And so stories like that abounded in the Bhutanese um, villages in that area because people started seeing these miraculous happenings. And it surrounded this Ganden monk, Gen Nima. He was up in the Portuguese forests for over 14, 15 years. And then his age started to catch up on him. And although his mind is totally lucid, his body was aging. So the monastery had sent representatives up to Bhutan to request Genima and his attendant to come down to Ganden, where they would provide a living space and quarters for him. And Genima accepted. You have to understand, many times before the monastery had asked Genima to come back to the monastery and live in the monastery and they would take care of him. But he had refused because he wanted the solitude. So, to the great sadness of the many villagers in the surrounding areas, I mean, they were far, but they were surrounding him, he had decided to go back to um, Gandhi Monastery and uh, the monastery officials had sent people up there to help him pack his meager things and to bring him down. And it was very big news in the monastery that Jolempa Genima is coming back to Gandhi Monastery. And so what happens was, uh, I have a house in Gandhi. My house is behind Trijalarang. My house is behind Trijalarang and Behind my house is Ganden Jamse's land. So on that land behind my house, the monastery had built a small house for Genima with a surrounding land and fence, and he would live there. And I think it was two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a, and a patio, and an audience room. An audience room is a room where Genima would sit to meet the public. So the monastery had built that for him and um, the next thing I know I was looking out my window and I see the monastery bringing this old monk to the house and Genima had, had moved in. And so these incredible tales that I've been hearing about him from my friend, suddenly this great monk from the, from the forest is living behind me. And he was literally about 100, 120 feet away. So I, from my bedroom window where I usually stayed to study, I had a very clear bird's eye view of his house because his entrance is nearly facing my window. Nearly. It's facing the main road, but so is my window. So his house is this way, my house is that way. So I can, I can see all the activities going on. So I would often see Genima come outside and go for a walk, and he would be assisted by his assistants. I would see the monastic dignitaries going to visit him. 
I would see many villagers going to visit him for blessings, for divinations, for direction, for advice. So whatever happened in his house, I had a clear bird's eye view. And I was amazed. So I was so moved and I was so enraptured and I was so taken that I started uh, buying vegetables and fruits and send over to his house to make offerings because I thought well every single day this great hermit monk is gonna have to eat and if he eats the vegetables and grains and food that I offer I'm gonna collect a lot of merit and then I in the future can go into retreat and, and gain high attainments just like him and it also benefit my sponsors if I offered him so I would offer him vegetables and fruits and grains and oils and sugars and uh, salts and all that stuff nearly every week. And Genny Moa complained, we can't eat all the food you're giving us. It's just too much. So I would joke Genny Moa because we became quite close because I visited him quite often, a few times a week. I would joke with him and I would say, have you ever heard of Buddha on the altar saying you're giving me too much offerings? And Genny Moa would just laugh and laugh and laugh and he'd say, but I'm not a Buddha. I said, never mind, to us you are. He said, but I'm not a Buddha. Yenima was a sprightly older monk who was, as I said, extremely alert and quick and um, stern looking to new people. But he had a very mischievous, childlike, jokey side to him that a lot of people didn't see until you got to know him better. And I was one of the few people who was able to tap into that side of him because I would always crack jokes with him and make him laugh. He just thought I was very funny. He would laugh and laugh. And I remember that his attendant said that he liked me very much because I would make him laugh. And the minute I walk into the door and he'd see me, he let out a laugh. <laughs> and then I sit down <laughs> every time. And I, would, and, and I would tell him stories. I would tell him jokes. I would tell him what's happening in the monastery. I'd ask for divination. I'd ask for advice. And I just generally enjoyed hanging out with this very holy, pure, attained monk. I mean, can you imagine, every time I walked to the house, I walked to his house, it's literally 100 feet away, you know, it's just a few seconds to get over there. I would walk into his house, and I would ask his attendants to meet him, and it would always be a yes, and then I would make prostrations. Every time, and I'd make an offering, and then I would sit down next to him. And he always welcomed me. He always sat up when he saw me, because he was a very humble monk. And um, sometimes I walk into the room and the room was filled with people, 30, 40 persons sitting there. And I would just sit there and I would say, oh, I'll come back later. And he said, no, 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 come sit down. So he would have me sit right next to him. And then I would watch him do divinations for the room. I mean, there would be 30, 40 persons. He would do one divination for a person. And then he'd do another one. Then he'd do another one. He'd give him advice, give him teachings. And sometimes he would blow blessings on them. And what was amazing was... Um, in India, we have a container, a plastic container, a round plastic container. In the West, it's like a margarine container, but in, the, in India, it was Amul cheese, A-M-U-L. It was a plastic container with a cap. And someone had offered Genima Amul cheese. He had eaten it up. He washed the Amul cheese um, container, and his divination dice was in that. I was amazed. Because usually when you go to, to Lamas to do divination, they would have silver or brass, or wooden, or very ornate divination boxes. Gany Ma's divination box was just Amul cheese. So you see him open up his Amul cheese cover, and he would ask the question, do divinations? And I caught him several times, throwing the divination dice down, not looking at it, and giving the answer. And I said to him, I caught you. He said, you caught me doing what? I said, I caught you using your clairvoyance, and you're not... Yeah, and I saw it. He said, what do you mean? I would say, well, I saw you telling people to answer without looking at the dice. And you're just throwing it and going along with the motions. He says, okay, okay, I'll look at it. I said, no, no, I already caught you. And he would laugh. He would laugh. I said, I knew it. I said, you have clairvoyance. He said, no, I don't have clairvoyance. You see, in the Gelugpa's teachings, according to Lama Tsongkhapa's way, highly attained monks have to be extremely humble and not show their powers and not talk about their powers 
This is the Ganyin way. This is the Gilupa way. So anyways, I caught Genima many times opening his Amul cheese container, throwing the dice, not looking at it, and giving very precise answers. And I said to him, I know you have clairvoyance, because I saw it. And always he would deny it. And it was amazing because he had a long pipe. The pipe was plastic and gray in color, and it was about two, one and a half, two feet. And a lot of people had a lot of ailments. There would be dizzy, headaches, or they had cancer, or they had uh, paralysis. And he would blow mantras through the pipe onto them. So if they had ailments in their head, he would take one end of the pipe to his mouth, the other end to their head, and they would hold it near his head, and he would blow the mantra onto their head. And I would be sitting there watching this. I mean, I saw it hundreds of times. And they would get well. Some of them who were very serious, they'd come a few times, and they'd get well. And it's amazing because some people had paralysis, and they would get well. When they go to the doctors, they just say, you can't. And I've seen people, because from my window, I can see the main road of Ganden, and the main road where people park their cars and walk down the dirt path to Genima's house, which is right behind my window. Because the dirt path behind Genima's house, when he first moved in, couldn't accommodate any cars. It was a dirt path, and people would get stuck in the mud. So people would park on the road, which is, oh, six, seven hundred feet away, and they would carry people who were paralyzed on their back to Genima's house. So people carry on their back paralyzed people, and I'd see it, to Genima's house. And Genima would blow the mantras on certain parts of their body. And these people would come every single day for three, four, five weeks, depending on the seriousness of the condition. And guess what? After a few weeks, these people who were paralyzed, they would be walking out of Genima's house slowly with the, with the help of their relatives. I saw this with my own eyes. That when they were brought into his house, they were, they, their legs are crunched up. Their hands are crunched up like that, just like that. They can't straighten their legs at all. They can't straighten their hands. Even their fingers are crunched up. And they're just frozen like this. And they're being carried on their relative's back, a male relative's back. And then when they bring them off the back, they have to bring them carefully and put them on a chair because they can't move their limbs. And Genimo would blow on their limbs. And you know what? Their limbs would move. And it wouldn't move back to normal, but it would move. Their fingers can wiggle. And then you would see they come back the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I mean, I didn't go every single day, but the few times I went, the same people kept coming because they had to come back for treatment every day. And Genima would take the pipe and blow on the various parts of their body. And you know what? After a while, after a few weeks, these people walked out of Genima's house. Their paralysis was improving. And weeks, weeks later, they can actually walk. And I saw this with my own eyes. And so news spread all over Mungar. It spread to the other colonies, Tibetan colonies, like Balakupe that was nearby, and Honsor. And you know, people started coming in troves by the bus loads to Genima's house to see him. Bus loads. I'm, 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 not tell, I'm telling you, bus loads. Not only Tibetan people, the local Indian people who lived by would come and see Genima because he was so famous. And the news spread to even the Dalai Lama. And I saw this with, all my, with my own eyes. I saw, the, I saw them building the house for Genima. I saw them moving him in. I saw him not known by anyone. I saw one or two visitors. And I saw 20 visitors. And I saw 50. Then I saw, oh my God, every single day, not less than 100 visitors. Every single day. And Genima's visitation would start around... Oh, two in the afternoon because he was meditating all morning and it would end around five o'clock because he would have dinner and do one more session of meditation every single day. He was doing divination. He was doing blessings. He was blowing mantras. 
And I saw once the local Indians, villagers, a local farmer, the local Indian farmers came around, and they told Genima that this year there has been no rain, and their crops are going to die, and they're going to starve. They have no income. They have no money. They have no business. They have nothing. And can Genima, the great Guruji, do something about this? And do you know what? Genima would be assisted outside of his house, and he'd take his pipe and point it to the air and blow into the air. I saw this with my own eyes. And do you know what? Within a half hour to two to three hours, after weeks of drought, it would rain. It would rain in front of our eyes. And I'm not talking about like a little bit. I mean rain. It wasn't torrential to kill, you know, uh, uh, the crops, but it was rain, and it rained every single day. I saw this. You know, at times it was so funny because Genima would just stand at the edge of the door and stick the pipe out the door. So I just see a pipe pointing at the, at the sky. I would literally see a pipe pointing at the sky, and I say, "Okay, Genima's blowing at the daisies again." <laughs> And it would rain, and this happened over and over, because there are different places where he blew it rain. It wouldn't rain everywhere; it would rain at the place the people requested. And guess what? Some years there was too much rain, and the crops would die, and the Indian farmers would come and say, "You know what? It's too much rain this year, and our crops are going to drown. Guruji, please do something." They're Hindus. They're not Buddhists, but they respect all Gurujis. They will come and touch Genima's feet and count out him, and they offer him a few meager vegetables or fruits, whatever they had, because they were very poor, or some some Indian yogurt dahi. They offered up. It was from their heart, and you would see Genima coming outside again at the door and blowing the pipe into the ceiling. I'm、uh, sorry, into the sky. And guess what? Within a few hours, the rain would stop. It wouldn't stop just that day; it would stop for days, and we saw this over and over and over and over. I have seen Genima in his room, in his audience room. I would be sitting next to him, and people would come who were possessed. And you know what he would do? He would take his pipe and hit them with it gently. I mean, it was it it, it was a little hard, but it wasn't very hard. But he would just hit them. And then he would blow mantras on them, and they would heal. I saw this many, 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 many times. I myself had some few, a few ailments, and I was very fortunate that Genima would、um, put the pipe to my head and blow on it through his pipe and bless me. But that had happened to me several times. And you know, it's not the tantric custom to ask a geshe or a lama or a monk or a nun. What's your main practice that you do? What mantra do you do to blow into the pipe? It's not customary because yidams and deities that you practice are secret. If you reveal the deity you practice, it is said that you cannot gain attainments. So I thought I'd take a chance. I mean, I knew the rules. I know he knows the rules. I thought, well, what can I lose? You just tell me to. He's not going to tell me. So he actually, I asked him. You know, I said, "What mantras do you use to blow on people who are sick? What mantra do you use to blow on people on into the sky? What mantras do you use for your divination? What mantra do you use for your exorcisms?" And I was sure he wouldn't tell me because it's against the rules. And he set out to me straightforward Yamantaka. And I went, "What?" He says, "Yes, I use Yamantaka's mantra." For the blessings, and I said, "What do you do when you blow into the sky?" He says, "Yamataka will tell the deities, the land gods, to give rain or stop rain. Yamataka will command them." So is that is that what you do? He says, "Yes." I make a request, and I blow the mantras up, and Yamataka will do his job. I said, "You don't do any other mantra." And he looked at me and laughed. And he says, "If you do Yamataka, you don't need any other mantra." He says Yamataka has thirty-four arms. One of the arms holds a pestle that's got a peacock feather to a vase, a ritual vase, 
And when you sprinkle water from that ritual vase, it purifies people. It's like a doji namjong puja, doji namjong ritual. And so when people who have who have drip or they have like unclean、um, bodies or they have paralysis, you do Yamataka's mantra because he's holding that means you can purify that problem. The Yamataka has another hand that gestures out in a threatening mudra. That threatening mudra represents a threat to the negative deities who may harm a practitioner. So when you use man,、uh, when you use the mantra on a person who's possessed, Yamataka's mudra of expelling that deity is in action. And I went, wow. So he says in Yamataka everything is complete. That's why he has thirty-four arms holding various instruments. To benefit sentient beings, he says, with Yamataka you don't need any other practice, nothing, nothing at all. And I said, so I thought it's my lucky day. He goes, so you know why the audience was cleared? A lot of people left. The rain, it was a little stormy, so people didn't come. His attendant served me tea, and Genima had a snack, and I was sitting there having a snack and tea with him. And then he was in a, he was in a jolly mood, so I asked him more questions, and I said to him.、Uh, What deity did you do when you were in Bhutan for those fifteen years? He said, "I did Yamataka." I said, "Wow, you didn't do any other deity?" He says, "I don't need to, because all the deities are embodied in Yamataka." So I'm thinking to myself, "What is it with the tantric rules that you're not supposed to tell?" And this monk tells me his secret. Then I realized, once you have actualized the deity and you have become one with the deity, you may tell because there's nothing to lose anymore. So I realized he has actualized and become one with Yamataka. That is why he can tell you openly the practice he does and the mantra he does, without forfeiting his attainments. So it matched perfectly what is said in the tantric texts. He told me this directly, not through a person, Genima the Jolimba. Told me directly that it's Yamataka. So he was in fifteen year Yamataka retreat. The blessings he does on people are Yamataka. The 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 mantra he blows on people to un to heal their paralysis Yamataka. The mantra he blows on people to heal their possessions are Yamataka. Before he does divinations, he does Yamataka visualization. Um. Whatever he does for other people is through Yamataka. Genima himself told me. And at that moment, I said to myself, "The Buddha's tantras, as spoken by the Buddha, work, and they're real. So if this works for Yamataka, then those who practice Hiruka, Vajugini, Hayagriva, Kala Chakra, Guya Samaja, Hevadra, will also have the same abilities." They will all work. It just depends on your affinity. And you know, I had this direct teaching experience with this this master. And、um, I asked him once. I said, "This is a little inauspicious, but I'm going to ask you because you're quite a direct monk and you don't mind directness." And I and I said, "Anyway, inauspicious things can't affect you anymore because you've achieved a level in your meditation." And he said, "What is it?" I said, if you pass away, you're going to have an incarnation. He says, no, there will be no incarnation. I will not be back. I said, the, where do you go? He says, I don't know, but I won't be back. His I don't know is he won't reveal to me, but he says he won't come back. He said it very clearly and directly. So I knew he had gained power over death and reincarnation. And、um, one day I was sitting with him, and I said to him, "You know, I go visit him a few times a week, and I sit with him at least two two hours, three hours a day."、Um, I was very blessed to be able to be in his presence and company, and I thought, being a young monk that I am, it's good for me to be around these senior monks who are so inspiring. It would be very good for my practice to be around his energy. So I once asked him. I said, "Can I ask you something that's a little controversial?" He says, "What is it?" I said to him, "What do you think about Doji Shukden?" 
And, and he said to me, Doji Shude is Manjushri. There's nothing to think about. And then he waved his hand like that. This is a Tibetan way of waving hand like there's nothing else to say. That's it. The end. So I said, Manjushri is Doji Shugden? I said, he said, yes. I said, do you practice Manjushri? I'm sorry, do you practice Doji Shugden? Gendima says, I don't practice Doji Shugden. I said, do you practice Pendant Lamo? Because that's the protector of Gandhi Changse. He says, no, I don't practice Pendant Lamo. I said, well, what do you practice? He says, I only practice Yamataka. Because if it's Yamataka, he's also a protector. I don't need any other protector. Anyways, Manjushri is all one. So I said, Doji Shukdin is a Buddha? He says, of course he's a Buddha. He says, and he laughed at me. He says, Manjushri is a Buddha. Of course, if he's Manjushri, he's a Buddha. So I said, how do you know this? He says, everybody knows this. All the High Lamas know this. All the High Lamas say this. He says, Doji Shukdin is Manjushri. So I said, let's confirm. Doji Shukdin is Manjushri? He said, yes. And I said, um, and he said it very matter-of-factly, like, what is there to think about? I said, there are people out there who think he's not Manjushri and he's not, he's not, he's negative. I said, what do you think about that? He says, that's their wrong view. Gendima is very direct and short on words. He says, it's their wrong view. He's Manjushri. So I said to him, okay, thank you, you know. I mean, I, I, mean, I would have all these conversations with him. And... Um, What was incredible was this story I have never said openly, but this was told to me by Genima himself. At that time, we had the 98th. 90. Anyway, at that time, we had a Gandhin Chiba from Gandhin Jiangsei. And he was, and I'll put in the number later, and his name was Jason Champel Champagne. And Gandhin Chiba, as you know, is the head of the Gelugpa sect, head of the Gelugpa school. And His Holiness, Gandhin Chiba, Jason Jampa Champagne, was extremely ill. And he had an attendant named Tashi. And Tashi would come to Genyima's house. I would see it through my window. Tashi wore, he was very tall and big, and he wore dark sunglasses, and he wore very new robes, and he come inside, and I'd seen him many times come and visit Ganima, and um, that was unusual, because he was Gandhi Chiba's assistant and attendant and uh, secretary. So the next time I went to visit Gan Ganima, I had said to him, is the Gandhi Chiba's secretary visiting you? He says, yes, he is. I said, many times, this is a few times. I said, for what, may I ask? He said, for divinations. I said, what, why? He says, Genima said to me, as you have heard, His Holiness Gandhin Chippa is extremely ill. So it would be improper for them to bring Gandhin Chippa to Genima's house because his rank is very high. So they had requested Genima to go to Gandhin Chippa's house to do blessings on him, which Genima did. So Genima had been carried and assisted over to Gandhin Chippa's house in Gandhin Jangsei Monastery, Pada comes in. He was the Pada Gandhin Chippa to bless Gandhin Chippa who was very, very ill. And I said to Genima, will he get well? And Genima says, if they follow the instructions I gave them, he will recover. If not, it will be very difficult for him to recover. So I said to him, may I ask what instructions you gave him? Is it secret? He says, it's not secret, I can tell you. He said that in a country north of India, there are some shamans there. They're anti-Gelukpa and they're very jealous of the Gelukpa sect and they call themselves Buddhists, but actually they practice black magic. And they had, they had obtained Gandhi Chiba's photo and his birth date and name, exact name, and placed it in a photo through ritual and buried it in the ground. And their purpose is to harm Gandhi Chiba to show that the Gilukpa lineage is not effective. And so 
that is why his holdings gone and are sick. So I said, really? I said, why is it that Gandhi Jiva can be so sick? He's such a high lama. He says it's the karma of the people that allows him to be so sick. I said, all right, that makes sense. And then I said, so what's the formula? What is the, what is the solution? He said the solution is this, is they need to do a full Doji Shuddin Torgya ritual. And I said, why Doji Shukdin? He says, Doji Shukdin has become the principal protector of Lama Tsongkhapa's tradition. Gen Nima told me that himself. And a Doji Shukdin Torgya, three days must be done. Three days of rituals, and on the third day, the Torma must be thrown into a ritual fire and burned, and then Gandhan Chippa will recover. The other solution is if they recovered the picture in which Gandhan Chippa was buried in. He says, you can't find the picture because it's quite a big area, quite a big terrain. So I said, why would people do that? They said, they're jealous. And he said, it's nothing new. They've had many people send magic to high lamas in the past. Saramji would have a lot of magic fall onto him or his house. Many people saw this in the form of lights hitting the roof of Saramji's house. Many people would do this for uh, people they were jealous of. So it was very common practice among the shamans, the Tibetan shamans. So I said, oh my goodness. So I said, how about if they do a Kalirupa Torgya? They said, no. My divination said it must be a Shukdin Torgya. And I said, so what's the issue? He said, the issue is Gandhin Chiba's secretary is a opponent of Shukdin practice. And he's been speaking for years that Shukdin is not good. And, and, I, and so I said to Ganima, what an irony. What an irony that the secretary of Gandhi Chiba, who has been speaking against Doji Shukdin, now has to do a Doji Shukdin Torgya three-day ritual to save his teacher's life. And Ganima said to me that when he told them that, they had a look of non-cooperation. So they ended up doing three-day Kalarupa Puja. The abbots of Sera, Jaipung, and Gandhin came, the abbots, and did the whole puja for Gandhin Chippa. But a few weeks after that, His Holiness Gandhin Chippa passed away. Some people might find this story a little unbelievable, but I had no reason to say this, except this is what was told to me by Genima. And Genima says, I don't prescribe people any pujas. I just tell them, according to divination, what puja they need to do. And that was the puja Gandhi Chiba needed, was a three-day Doji Shukdin. And I was a little saddened by that because I thought the secretary should have done the three-day Doji Shukdin puja to save Gandhi Chiba's life. But instead, he chose to save his own face and not be embarrassed and let his guru die. Because remember, he was speaking against Doji Shukdin, and it would be ridiculous that now, he would have to do Doshi and his puja to save his guru's life. But that is exactly what happened. Exactly is that. I told that to my friend Gen Punso. Gen Punso listened. He had no comments. I told that to my students in the house. And I told that to Kensu, Kensu Mji Jason Jambai Yeshi of Gandhan Shatsi, who lived with me upstairs. Again, Ken Suramji, Jason Jambai Yeshi was extremely upset by that, and he had wished that they had done the Doji Shudin Puja to save Gandhan Chippa's life, but they did not. And one day I saw Genima had a little tanka. I would say oh, about 11 inches and maybe four or five inches in width of tonkapa. It was a tiny little tanka, hand painted, and it was hanging on his opposite wall, opposite of him. And I said to him, 
What's that tanka? He said, oh, that was with me in Bhutan when I was in retreat. And that had been with me for 15 years. I said, it's so small and so far away, you couldn't possibly see it now because your room is quite long. And I said, how about if I give you a big tanka and, I have, and you can give me this one? And he said to me, he laughed, he said, you really want this one? It's so small. He didn't say so small. He says, do you really want this one? I said, yeah, I want it. He says, you can have it. I looked at him and I repeated, I can have your tanka that sat in retreat with you for 15 years in Bhutan and I can just take it home now. He says, yes, if you like it, you can have it. I bowed, I said thank you, I folded my hands, I grabbed the tanka and ran out of the house, ran to my room before his attendant caught me and changed his mind. <laughs> and to this day, I have this holy tanka given to me by Gen Nima that it had been in his retreat for a decade and a half, and that's how holy it is. It is it's going to be pictured here in the blog post. And then another day I was at his house, as I told you, I visited him for years. He had a long bodhisattva mala, and he had used it so much that his thumb had an imprint of the mala because he had used it so much. And um, I said to him, is that a new mala? Knowing that it's not. He says, no, I've been using this mala um, since I was in Bhutan. I said, all those years, for about 15 years? He says, I don't remember how many years, but it's the whole time I was in Bhutan. I said, that's about 15 years. You've been using that mala and your retreat and all your sessions, all your yamatakas on that mala. He said, yeah. I said, that mala is quite old looking and it's a little worn. How about if I trade it in for a new one? He laughed. He laughed as he usually does. And he said to me, you like this mala? I said, yes. He says, why? I said, because you ha it has your energy on it and you've been doing retreats for years. He says, but I'm nothing, it's nothing, it's no big deal. I said, no, it's a big deal. Can I have your mala? <laughs> I, just said, I, got, I just said it straight out. He says, if you have it, you can have If you like, you can have it. He says, here. I grabbed it. I said, do you have another one? He says, yeah, I have a smaller one. He took his smaller one and used it, that was it. The smaller one was a new one. I grabbed this mala and I ran home. Again, to avoid the attendants in case attendants changed their mind. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that I had a mala, a whole 108 um, beads that this old holy monk had used for his 15 years of Yamataka retreat in the forest. So what I did was, as per tradition, I had many bodhisattva malas, approximately the same size new ones. I'd restrung a new one and I went the very next day and I offered him a new mala and I said this. He says, oh, you're giving my mala back. I said, no, no, no. This looks exactly like yours, but it's a new one, as I promised. And I said, here. He says, oh, thank you. And he grabbed the mala and used it. And for the next week or two weeks, I was a little nervous every time I visited him because I was afraid if his attendant would ask me, where's the mala and tanka? <laughs> but they never asked. And to this day, I had the mala and I had the tanka with me. So it's highly, highly blessed. His Holiness... Another time, His Holiness the Dalai Lama had come to Gandhian Monastery to give teachings. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama had heard about the fame and the high attainments of this old monk. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama wanted to visit the old monk, but there was no road to go to his house. The Dalai Lama himself wanted to drive in his car to visit the old monk, not call him to his room. But they said there's no road. So they had no choice. They had to carry Genima. They literally carried him. Because by this time, he was a little older. And he was manifesting difficulty in walking. And they carry him. I saw him carry him out the window. Four monks carried him physically to the Gundam Prayer Hall, to the top where, the Dalam was, where His Holiness Dalam was staying. And he had an audience. And one of the attendants were there. Later we found out the Dalai Lama questioned him. When he meditated on this part, what did he see? When he meditated on that, what did he see? At this level of meditation, what did he observe? So Genima had told him everything, and apparently Dalai Lama certified his attainments are real. Totally certified. 
And then the next thing we had heard the Dalai Lama has said to Genima, since you have reached this high attainments, you will heal your body and you will walk and you will reverse your age and you will not die. Genima was ordered by the Dalai Lama not to die or show signs of old age or sickness. And in end, because when you reach high levels of meditation, you can control your body in that way, in the time of your death. So I was told that Genima obeyed the Dalai Lama and said, I will obey. So the Dalai Lama was in Gandhan for another week or so, and then he finished giving his teachings and left. And then I observed the window. From the time Genima saw the Dalai Lama where he was carried up and down, after a few days, he can walk. After a few more days, he can walk faster. After a few more days, he can walk without anyone to help him with a stick. After that, he can walk. I saw him gain his ability to walk back because he was commanded by the Dalai Lama. This I saw with my own eyes. So that's why I know if you practice the higher tantras, you definitely have control over your body and your time of death with my own eyes. I asked Genima about his audience with Dalai Lama. What he asked, Genima wouldn't tell me. He said, nope, it's not for you to know. But I found out from his attendant who told Genputsu, who told me. So it was the same thing. I had a student who I am not connected with anymore when I was in Singapore. I was in Singapore and I was sitting there doing a Setra Puja. And this student of mine, who's a woman, started to shiver and appear to take trance. So I wasn't uh, sure what was happening so what I did was, I did a divination, and the divination said that it is our protector taking trance of her, Doji Shukden. I contacted Ganchen Rinpoche, I contacted Jigun Rinpoche, I contacted Lati Rinpoche, and I contacted Kensu Rinpoche, Jason Jamba Yeshi. I contacted the four lamas to do independent divinations to confirm who is taking trance of her. And they all confirmed is the Dharma protector, Doji Shukden is taking trance of her in his wrathful form and that she would not be able to speak but she would have to do some cleansing of the body and she would have to do some purification and extensive retreats she would have to do Laman Tsongkhapa Gandhan Hlagyama retreat she would have to do Yamantaka retreat and she would have to do Doji Shudan retreats so after I confirmed that I invited her to my house in Gandhan to do retreats and while she was doing retreats there, Pastor Chia was there to assist her. And um, she, was brought to, she was brought over to Lati Rumchi to bless her. She was brought to Kensu Rumchi to bless her. She was brought to Genima to bless her. I brought her myself to these three great lamas. When I brought her to each of the three lamas, she took trance in front of the three lamas. When she took trance in front of Gen. Lati room, in front of Lati Rumchi, Lati Rumchi blessed her by blowing mantras on her. When she took, and he was very pleased and he was laughing because he knew who it was. And when she took trance in front of Kensu Jamba Yishi, Kensu Jamba Yishi used his own cup and offered her to drink tea directly from his cup, which meant it's a very high level protector there. I saw this with my own eyes. Nobody uses Kensu Rumchi's cup. We would never dare use Kensu Rinpoche's cup because it is our guru and we would not profane it. Kensu Rinpoche himself took his own cup and they had tea in it, black, uh, yes, tea, and he gave it to her to drink and he blessed her and he was very pleased and he put a cut on her. When I brought her to Genima, it was amazing. She walked into the room and sat down and she started taking trance immediately. And this is what happened. Genima told us that she took trance of several deities. One was Dorji Shukden, 
Another one was Yamataka. And I said to him, Yamataka could take trance? He says, of course. Any deity can take trance is whether the oracle can accommodate the deity or not. And Yamataka is formless, of course he can. And I said, so who was in front of you just now? He says, Yamataka was here, Benden Lama was here, and Doji Shuten was here. And then he took his pipe and blew on her forehead, blew on her body to clear her channels so she can take better trance. And he certified her to be a genuine oracle. Then I assisted her back to my house, which was right next door. And she had stayed there for two weeks, three weeks to retreat. But unfortunately, she was feeling very homesick. She was very missing her children. And she didn't finish the retreat and she returned back to Singapore. So because of that, she was able to complete her training and therefore not be able to become a fully fledged oracle, which would have been the first Doji Shukden non-Tibetan oracle. But that is exactly what happened. She did not finish her retreat. Later, this lady and I had some differences and she deci we decided to part ways. And after we had parted ways, then I had asked the protector not to take trance anymore of her because it is without supervision. And those are some of the experiences I have with this extremely wonderful, excellent, renowned monk, Genima. And um, I had the great honor to live such, near such a great practitioner, a monk who had stayed in retreat, meditational retreat for decades in the mountains, who had finished his studies and didn't want any degrees, didn't want to go for examination, didn't want any fanfare, didn't want any position or didn't want any name or status and immediately went into meditation. So I knew, just as the Dharma text has said, that if one enters retreat and does the practice well, one can gain genuine, highly, high level realizations. Genima was one of these great hermit monks who was an ascetic and who was a yogi who had followed Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings from the time of his youth and mastered the teachings and entered into Tantra and adopted the tantric practices, in this case Yamataka, and gained high level attainments. I saw him heal people, I saw him exercise spirits, I saw him predict the future, I saw him control the weather, I saw him joke and play, I saw him stern. I've seen him scold some monks very sternly who wouldn't listen. I've seen him show his miraculous powers over and over and also many other Rinpoches were found by him when people, when a Lama died, when a High Lama died, they would come to him and he would give an exact prediction of where they will be reborn, their place, and he would confirm their incarnation. So he had recognized many new reincarnations. And if they said that Genima said that this was a genuine reincarnated Lama, Atuku, the whole monastery and even the Dalai Lama would accept. So I've seen the power of this old monk and I've been wanting to explain my experiences with him for many years now. And I'm very happy I have the opportunity to blog about him. My purpose, about, my purpose for blogging about this holy old monk Jolempa Genima. Ganden Changse Jolempa Genima. My purpose is to tell you that if we engage in the meditations and practices of Tantra, they really do transform a person into an exalted being. Thank you, Tamra Mchi.